Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Patrick O'Brien. I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty uh, of Law. And it is my privilege to invite to the podium uh, uh, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Internationalization, Advancement and Student Affairs of the University of Johannesburg, uh, Professor Tinyuku Maluleke. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. What a joy and pleasure to welcome you, all of you, each one of you, to the University of Johannesburg. I am particularly pleased to welcome in our midst the International Court of Justice, uh, those who represent it, those who represent the Permanent Court of Arbitration, as well as those coming from the Hague Conference on Private International Law. I have also seen in our midst colleagues from our sister universities, both locally and internationally, some of whom I know. I welcome you all. Allow me to isolate a number of prominent uh, persons in our midst for special mention. And I start with His Excellency, Judge A. A. Yusuf of the International Court of Justice, who is in our midst. His Excellency, Mr. H. H. Sibles, Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. His Excellency, Dr. C. Benasconi, whom I had the pleasure to meet outside just before we came in here, Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, His Excellency Mr. R.J. Seeger, Charge d'Affaires, Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in South Africa, also whom I had the pleasure to meet outside, and he is the host of the Hague Delegation. Let me also recognize the presence of international organizations in The Hague, at the Embassy of the Netherlands, the City of The Hague in particular, Professor M. Perdegas, First Secretary at The Hague Conference on Private International Law, who had a key role in arranging the conference in consultation with the Research Center for Private International Law in emerging countries. And we at UJ are very proud to have been part of that collaboration that has led to this conference. Also allow me to welcome Ms. L. Bosman, Senior Legal Counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration the Honorable Judge R. Zulman, Judge Emeritus of the Supreme Court of Appeal, from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, allow me to welcome in our midst Mr. V. Ndichwa, Director, and Mr. S. J. Kreis, Deputy Director at the Directorate of Development Strategy and Legislation Consular Services, and again, from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, I welcome Advocate Y. Duarica, Principal State Law Advisor in the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor, who is also Vice Chair of uh, the Council on General Affairs and Policy of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. I welcome Mr. Thierry Skotze, State Law Advisor in the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor, International Law. I welcome Professor D. Gersberger, University of Lausanne, and Professor C. F. Fawcett from the University of Cambridge, and our very own Professor Derek van der Merve, former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Strategic Services at the University of Johannesburg. I've already welcomed academics from various universities in Southern Africa and members of the legal profession, the press, students, ladies and gentlemen. 
Given the highly esteemed and respected company of top international jurists and legal minds present here today, I feel like the main protagonist in Franz Kafka's 1964 parable titled Before the Law. Many of you here will know that parable. I feel I stand here today before the law, as it were, because I have several stood among so many top lawyers and jurists in my short life. When I look around, I can feel, smell, and almost touch the law. As the Kafka story goes, having arrived at the gate of the law and being in conversation with the doorkeeper of the law was not enough to facilitate entry for the man from the country who sought entry to the law in that parable. For a long time, if I may just say briefly something about that parable before I get to the main comments. For a long time, Kafka's doorkeeper to the law responds to the pleas of the countrymen by constantly saying, not yet. Many years and many brides later, when the seeker of entry to the law is old and about to die, the seeker asks why he has been denied entry all these years, even though no one else ever used the entry. The doorkeeper says, and I quote, no one else could ever be admitted here since this gate was made only for you. I am now going to shut it. End of parable. Now we know that for half a century, the meaning of this parable has been the subject of intense debate and theorizing. Was the doorkeeper deceitful or was he an obedient servant of the law? Was the entry seeker gullible or was he unknowingly law-abiding in his pursuit of entry to the law? Who is the entry seeker and who is the dog keeper? I shall leave the final details of the debate and the theorizing to the legal and literary scholars, except to note that access to, recognition by, equality before the law, and timely justice remain critical for human dignity and human development today. In this regard, the University of Johannesburg was most pleased when the Hague Conference requested a long-term cooperation with our Faculty of Law. We are extremely proud of our history of cooperation with the Hague going back to the year 2007 when we signed an agreement. In terms of that agreement, the Law Library accommodates the Regional Information Center of the Hague Conference, and our colleague, Professor Jan Niels, has been involved in the working group of the Special Commission and in the drafting committee for the Special Commission for the Hague Principles on Choice of Law in International Contracts. Also, Advocate Lisa Fredericks is a member of the working group for the Hague Judgments Project. And we are very proud of these representatives of the University of Johannesburg on such important global legal forum. I note that the theme of the conference, building a global framework to facilitate trade and investment, is opposite. In this regard, the contributions being made by three international organizations in the Hague, whom I have already uh, mentioned, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, will be in focus. I note, too, that particular attention will be given to the most recent instrument of the Hague Conference, the Hague Principles on Choice of Law in International Contracts, and the role it may play in the development of law in emerging jurisdictions, in particular in Southern Africa. 
We at the University of Johannesburg are thankful that this event is co-sponsored by the municipality of The Hague. It could perhaps be said that The Hague is the legal capital of the world and we are proud to be partners today with the municipality of The Hague. There is no doubt that the construction of a reliable transnational legal infrastructure in respect of international trade and investment is a prerequisite for inclusive economic growth and development and therefore the alleviation of poverty here and everywhere. A situation where many nations of the world continue to feel like Kafka's seeker of entry into either the global economy or international legal instruments can no longer be sustained. This country and the continent of Africa certainly wishes to take its place among the continents and the nations of the world in the 21st century. Given that in 2013, Africa was the continent with the highest percentage of economic growth, and I'll skip the percentages, this continent is very much eager to participate in the construction of the transnational legal framework for the regulation of international trade. And so is this country of South Africa. To this end, the University of Johannesburg has thrown its weight and energy into the development of the transnational legal infrastructure in Africa and by extension to the sustainable growth of the continent. UJ Law scholars and researchers are intimately involved in the drafting of the so-called African Principles of Commercial Private International Law, which is an effort done under the auspices of the Research Center for Private International Law in emerging countries. In this way, we hope to contribute to the development of model laws for transnational trade. These model laws could be utilized by national legislators and by African economic integration organizations, particularly the African Union, in respect of domestic and regional laws for a binding or soft law nature. In this regard, and in pursuit of building a global framework to facilitate trade and investment. We at UJ stand ready to cooperate with national governments, with the African Union, with the International Court of Justice, the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the Hague Conference on Private International Law, and many other national countries including the AU. We are ready to cooperate with you in the construction of this framework which will make it possible for nations of the world to trade justly, effectively, and fairly. So in conclusion, I want to say that on behalf of the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Iron Ronsbeck, who is unfortunately not able to come and welcome you himself, and on behalf of all our 49,000 students located in each of our four campuses, one of which is this one where you are, particularly on behalf of those students in our law faculty, and on behalf of this university, which is now almost 10 years old since the measure of its SY legacy institutions. I want to bid you welcome and wish you a fruitful consultation during this day when you continue to discuss and deliberate on these very important issues I tried to highlight. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Professor Moleleke. It is now my privilege to call on His Excellency, Mr. R.J. Sikha, the charger for the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and to make a few opening remarks. Professor Maroleke, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, O'Brien, Executive Dean, um, Professor 
Niels, uh, Director of the Research Center for Private International Law in Emerging Countries. Um, His Excellency Judge Yusuf, the International Court of Justice. His Excellency Ms. Sibel, Secretary General for the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Dr. Dennis Cody, Secretary General, Hague Conference on Private International Law. Colleagues from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. And cooperation, dear colleagues, uh, friends. Um, my name is uh, Robert Siegert. I'm the uh, acting uh, ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in South Africa. And it is indeed, indeed a great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you this morning. Um, our embassy is uh, uh, accompanying a delegation uh, of secretaries general, uh, judges, and presidents of a number of um, uh, very important uh, legal institutions in The Hague um, who are here in South Africa for an outreach tour. This uh, outreach tour started yesterday on, on Monday. Today we are, uh, we are here, we'll be flying to Cape Town tonight uh, and we'll have another day of, uh, of meetings and exchanges over there tomorrow. Um, the idea of the program is to have uh, this delegation from, uh, from The Hague engage with uh, students, academics, lawyers, the media, uh, representatives from government, um, the judiciary, of course, um, and obviously this uh, this seminar this morning is uh, is one of the is one of the highlights. Just wanted to say a couple of words on the program and and also our thinking and motivation behind it. Um, for us as an embassy, we um, uh, we really believe it's essential that the important issues uh, about our world are uh, critically debated and, uh, and discussed. And this program we are organizing this week, so that's not this conference, but the, the, the wider program, we have called it the Dialogues on Peace and Justice program, is really about, uh, about essentially two factors. One is uh, a deep appreciation for the lessons and the views that South Africa has to offer to these uh, debates on peace and justice. Uh, and obviously also a deep appreciation for the work that the many institutions in The Hague do on peace and justice, and as you may uh, may know, uh, the city houses more than 18,000 people working for international um, organizations, working on those matters on a on a daily basis, and we find that very uh, very important. Um, yesterday um, we had a, we had a, a full day. We had uh, consultations with government representatives, the Ministry of, uh, of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. The Department for International Relations and Cooperation. There were roundtable discussions uh, organized at uh, at WITS. We were very, very privileged to have uh, had a number of private audiences with the uh, Honorable Chief Justice and the private dinner offered by the, by the, by the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa. And we had a reception there as well. Um, this morning we attended uh, collectively the opening of a conference on the ICC and Africa. And indeed, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here now spending uh, a good part of today um, uh, at the University of Johannesburg for the seminar on building a global framework to facilitate tr um, trade and investment. And it just shows um, the very many angles of peace and justice that we try to cover this week in, uh, in South Africa. So we deeply appreciate um, the work also uh, by the UK of UK colleagues and the effort invested to make, in making today a big, uh, a big success. We uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity of working with you and the opportunity to, uh, to address you and say uh, a, a few words. I'd like to stop here. I wish you uh, a, fruitful, uh, a fruitful day and, uh, and good, uh, good deliberations and looking at, uh, at the program and the speakers you have here, I'm sure, to be a resounding success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siegert. We will start off with this first session on uh, where we will be dealing with the three pillars of the international legal work in the Hague, the ICJ, PCA, and then the HCCH. And uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, the three speakers, uh, Mr. Yusuf, uh, uh, Mr. Sigles, and Dr. Magnus Cody, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Our, our first speaker today will be His Excellency Judge a a Yusuf. Uh, judge Yusuf uh, is a judge at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. He studied at the University of Somalia 
and obtained his PhD at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. He worked for various UN organizations and lectured in Geneva and at the Hague Academy of International Law. Just Yusuf published books on international trade and emerging countries and on the African Union. He is also the founding editor of the African Yearbook of International Law. Just Yusuf. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, the Dean of the Law School of uh, uh, Johannesburg. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure for me uh, to be here with you today. Uh, we have, uh, since yesterday, been speaking uh, to various audiences uh, about our respective institutions and the functions of our institutions. So I have uh, somehow the impression that I will be uh, repeating myself to some extent. Um, but I hope that uh, most of you and most of the audience here, and I feel that uh, have not participated uh, in the other meetings uh, uh, where we spoke since yesterday. So I think I just risk uh, being uh, or, or, or uh, sounding like a, a broken record to myself, but hopefully not to you, uh, when I speak again about the International Court of Justice. Uh, there are, of course, uh, various ways of uh, uh, talking about the work of the International Court of Justice. And uh, in view of the time uh, at our disposal, uh, I will try uh, to give you, in a nutshell, uh, the functions uh, of the International Court of Justice, its activities, and in particular, to address uh, the work of the International Court of Justice with respect to Africa. And, of course, uh, the historical background to the relations of the court with South Africa, uh, which uh, had not necessarily been always uh, a felicitous uh, relationship. Uh, first of all, to start with the role of the court and uh, uh, what the court exactly do, uh, I would refer uh, to the fact that the court is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. It is sometimes referred to uh, as the World Court because it's a court which uh, tries to settle uh, disputes uh, among the states. And I say tries uh, because uh, it is ultimately uh, up to the states concerned uh, to uh, uh, peacefully settle those disputes. But the judgments of the court are binding on them. And uh, we have, uh, uh, so far, uh, had no cases in which uh, the judgments of the court had been totally ignored by the states to which uh, they were addressing. There have been some difficulties in certain cases of implementing those judgments but there was never an outright rejection and uh, a lack of acceptance of the binding judgment of the court. And the main reason is because although the statute of the International Court of Justice is an annex to the Charter of the United Nations, and therefore uh, it is part and parcel of the Charter of the United Nations, and all the states, members of the United Nations, are also parties to the statute of the court. The jurisdiction of the court is founded on the consent of the states uh, that come before. And that consent is a, a pillar uh, of the work of the court. Uh, because states are not like individuals. Uh, you cannot simply drag them before a court. Uh, and especially at the time when this court and its predecessor, the Permanent Court of International Justice, and the Permanent Court of International Justice was created in 1923, 
When these two institutions were created, there was a marked reluctance on the parties of states, which were extremely jealous of their sovereignty, to submit their disputes to an independent international adjudicatory process. And they felt that this would, in a way, encroach and impinge on their sovereignty. So the acceptance of a judicial settlement of disputes has evolved since the early 20th century uh, to the extent that today uh, we find that a, a numerous states, both from the developing world and from the developing world, from east and from west, from north and from south, uh, resort uh, to the uh, dispute settlement procedures of the International Court of Justice. Uh, the court has had to deal uh, with disputes between European countries, uh, disputes between Latin American countries, disputes between Asian countries, disputes between African countries, and all of this is actually based on the consent given by these states to have their disputes settled by the court and to recognize the jurisdiction of the court. Apart or in addition to this core function of dealing with contentious cases and peacefully uh, settling disputes between states, the court as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations also provides advisory opinions to the principal organs of the United Nations and to specialized agencies of the United Nations authorizing uh, to request such opinions from the International Court of Justice. And up to now, 26 such requests have been submitted to the International Court of Justice. Of those 26, seven actually concern Africa. And out of that seven, four concern the relationship between apartheid South Africa and Southwest Africa, and the difficulties that the United Nations had to convince apartheid South Africa to relinquish it is uh, a uh, mandatory powers as a mandatory power. It is mandated uh, on the territory of Southwest Africa, and to accept the supervisory authority of the United Nations over that territory in order to prepare uh, for its independence. So the International Court of Justice has a long history. Uh, with the relationship between uh, South Africa and Southwest Africa, and not only with respect to the advisory opinions, but also with respect to the first two cases that were ever submitted to the International Court of Justice by two independent African states. And those two African states were Ethiopia and Liberia. And the case that they filed with the court was actually against apartheid South Africa. And the main reason was because of Southwest Africa and the need to have Southwest Africa prepared for its independence, like the rest of the African countries, which in the 1960s whether they were trusteeship territories or whether they were colonies, uh, had acquired their independence. But the court, I must admit, faltered in that case and failed actually uh, to see and to apply the changes that had taken place with respect to international law and international relations around the world. And for quite a long time, African states, not only African states, but also uh, Asian states and even Latin American states, all the emerging states of the world or the developing countries of the world or what was referred to at the time as the third world, 
stayed away from the International Court of Justice because of what happened between that case. And it is only in the 1980s that the court was able to regain the confidence and the trust of all those countries. And one of the main reasons was because from the 1960s to 1980s, the United Nations also engaged in an intensive process of reform and reformulation and development and advancement of international law. And the newly independent countries of Africa, Asia, and the older independent countries of Latin America actively participated in that process of reform of international law. And the court showed its willingness to apply this reformed system of international law in advisory opinions on Namibia in 1970 and on the Western Sahara in 1971. So the court clearly spelled out that what was happening at the UN General Assembly was actually part of the process of development and reformulation of international law in order to take into account the changes that had taken place on the, at the international stage. And this reaffirmation and recognition by the court of these changes have reassured uh, the status of the, uh, what was referred to as the third world. And from the 1980s, you have an increasing number of Latin American and African states that started to bring cases before the International Court of Justice to the extent that in the 1990s, the court received 11 cases from African states, either cases that had to be settled between an African state and another African state, or cases that had to be settled between an African state and a non-African state, or a state outside Africa. And in the years between 2000 and 2010, another nine cases were brought uh, to the International Court of Justice by African states, or they were brought against also, in some cases, the African states themselves. So the court was able to reacquire the confidence and trust of the African states, and today, the African states and the Latin American states are actually, uh, they bring the highest number of cases before the International Court of Justice. A turning now uh, to the uh, <coughs> cases that have been dealt with by the, by the court uh, uh, in a very brief manner. It is a little bit difficult to fit uh, the, the caseload of the court and the cases brought before the court into a typology of cases. Uh, many people sometimes associate the court because uh, the court has actually developed the jurisprudence on delimitation, territorial and maritime delimitation, and has performed to some extent a pioneering work on the international law of delimitation, both territorial and maritime delimitation. So many people in their mind think that the most important case, cases that have come before the court are actually cases on delimitation, but that's not the case. Uh, the, the court's work on the use of force, for example, uh, in international relations, the court's work on human rights, like the recognition of the collective rights and the recognition of people's rights. The court's work on environmental law have uh, given rise to an increasingly important corpus of jurisprudence that, is, that has contributed in its turn 
uh, to the development of international law and that has contributed to the advancement of the frontiers of international law so that international law could deal uh, with new areas uh, of uh, international law like uh, human rights and could streamline, in the case of human rights, could streamline human rights into international law. And actually it is some of the important cases of the International Court of Justice which have uh, led to the streamlining of human rights in international law. But it's not only limited to these issues, it also goes, and I hope that we will have a little bit of time to talk about that later today, it also covers uh, international investment law. Because one of the most important cases uh, that uh, uh, the court is well known for, and uh, the jurisprudence uh, uh, of the court is well known for, is the Barcelona traction case of the 1960s, and that was a case on investment. And now, recently, the court had to deal, actually, for the first time, with a case on investment between two African states, uh, uh, between Guinea and the Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo. So, resource-related, investment-related, development-related, cases are also uh, cases that keep coming up uh, before the International Court of Justice and on which the court has been able to develop its jurisprudence and to contribute to the advancement of international law. But I hope that we can have a, a dialogue on that uh, later today or in the uh, question and answer uh, segment of, of this uh, session. And I thank you very much. Our next speaker is His Excellency Mr. H. A. Simmes, who is the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. He studied at the Free University of Amsterdam and he joined the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he became the Director General for Political Affairs. Uh, Mr. Simmes also served as the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in France. Mr. Simmes. Thank you, Professor O'Brien, for that introduction. Um, I think I have to make uh, two disclaimers before introducing to you uh, with some uh, PowerPoints uh, uh, the uh, uh, two issues. One is, as you have said, uh, although I, have a, uh, I was um, trained as a lawyer and have some background in public international law, I spend most of my time in different areas of the foreign industry. So I'm, I think I'm more like that diplomat Jack of all trades who knows a little bit about many things but not very much about one thing in particular. Uh, so if you have uh, very um, thorough questions, I may stand excused to, to some extent. The second is is that this is the second time I do a PowerPoint presentation. The first one this morning went rather well, so I hope I have I have, uh, I have a positive expectation of uh, how we uh, go about this one. We skip this one. Here you see some quotes from uh, Grotius, the law uh, of war and, and peace, which stresses the importance of arbitration as a means of peaceful settlement of disputes. I think that um, somewhat later, that uh, arbitration, uh, really, international arbitration between states really took off, uh, notably in uh, the form of the uh, Jay uh, Treaty um, between uh, the US and the UK of 1795, uh, which uh, dealt with uh, uh, issues still open after the peace agreement that ended the American War of Independence. And it determined, among others, the disputes over the American Canadian boundary of wartime debts should be submitted to arbitration. Uh, the other picture relates to the landmark arbitration case of the Alabama uh, claims of 1872, a uh, well known, no doubt, to all of you, which related to a dispute over 
uh, warships supplied by uh, British uh, shipwrights to the south during the American Civil War, uh, responsible subsequently for significant damage to the American merchant uh, navy. And um, the final award uh, eventually was for 15.5 million. Um, it uh, came back uh, recently uh, with, um, in connection with a case dealt with by the PCA, uh, to which we may refer later, uh, uh, where uh, the tribunal established an amount of 51 billion. I don't know whether it was euro or dollars. I guess it's dollars. Uh, 51 billion for um, Dupas shareholders um, that had initiated an arbitration against uh, Russia. And the question was whether the Alabama uh, award was the biggest one uh, or whether this one was the biggest one. And the jury is still out, I think, depending on what uh, criteria one would apply.
uh, the uh, ambassadors accredited to the Netherlands. Then there is an other uh, component of that structure. It says the members of the court, each member state is entitled to appoint four um, experts and uh, that are eligible uh, subsequently for a nomination in uh, arbitral tribunals. Um, Africa, South Africa, excuse me, has actually three uh, of such members of the court, um, but these uh, members of the court are also uh, uh, the institution that is involved in nominating and, and, and um, proposing uh, candidatures for judges of the ICJ and the ICC. And some people say that member states focus more on the latter role of the national group and on the role of those individuals as arbitrators. Finally, in the lower picture, you see uh, members of my staff, um, in total some uh, 40 people, uh, lawyers, uh, administrative staff, financial staff, uh, two of them are from South Africa, and uh, we are proud to be able to present uh, two parties seeking our assistance, uh, support, uh, using all sorts of languages, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, uh, French, English, Russian, and so on and so forth. Um, that was where we came from. What do we do for a living? Uh, as I said, the uh, BCA is a permanent uh, mechanism to provide services to uh, arbitral, institution, uh, arbitral tribunals, and uh, it uh, stretches from the very basic uh, management of the deposits to the more uh, substantive work related to uh, research on specific issues of law uh, put to them by the arbitral tribunal. I should say at this particular point in time that I'll come back to that, that um, the PCA, although established initially as an institution to deal with interstate disputes has developed, developed into an institution that is also capable of uh, assisting arbitrations of a mixed nature where one of the parties is a private entity, uh, the other party being a state or state controlled entity or intergovernmental organization. In fact, the latter is the, most, uh, the largest, uh, uh, provides us with the largest number of cases. Uh, of a total of some hundred. The interstate uh, arbitrations uh, are amount to some eight at present, uh, and quite a few uh, of some significance. Um, secondly, um, the PCA, this was the previous one, this is the one I'm talking about now. Uh, the Secretary General has been authorized under the United Nations um, uh, International Trade Law Arbitration Rules and uh, to act as either an, an appointing authority or a um, designating authority. And what is that? Uh, the appointing authority has the authority to act at the request of a claimant on the basis of a prima facie judgment um, to appoint an arbitrator on behalf of the respondent who refuses, in a particular case, to appoint an arbitrator. And um, that might go on uh, to lead to also the appointment of the uh, presiding arbitrator in case the two arbitrators do not reach an agreement there. And up to now, uh, the PCA Secretary General, my predecessors included, have dealt with some 500 of such cases. This is an indication of the growth of our uh, docket. You see interstate is um, still rather limited, eight cases there. Um, the majority is investment, um, investor state uh, arbitration, and the rest is um, um, either based on, mostly based on contract, and can um, deal with uh, an unlimited number of uh, issues um, uh, for instance, um, a breach of contract, 
uh, in the relation between an intergovernmental organization and a service provider, which provides for arbitration then. This is the um, graph representing our, um, um, our docket in uh, 2013, almost 100 arbitrations in total, including 35 newly uh, registered in that year, um, 61 investor state arbitrations based on the bilateral or multilateral investment treaty. This is, this is, I think, an interesting part. I'm back to um, um, the more, no, I wouldn't say the more traditional work because one of those arbitrations that I would want to call your attention to is the uh, well-known ABJ arbitration related to the delimitation uh, of the border uh, between what is now Sudan and South Sudan, but at the time was a conflict uh, between the central government and Khartoum and the uh, South Sudanese liberation movement. And quite an exceptional uh, type of arbitration uh, for a number of reasons, uh, both because of the, uh, the parties involved, but also because of the speed with which the award was reached in, inside of nine months after the constitution of the tribunal, uh, the extent of uh, transparency achieved uh, that arbitration, I would say maximum, high watermark, as they say, in terms of transparency for arbitration uh, cases uh, with uh, webcasting, um, uh, hearings public, open to the public, uh, a word being published in, um, in both in the English and the Arabic language, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the PCA historically has been involved in cases related to Africa, disputes on the African continent, um, in the 90s, the uh, Ethiopia-Eritrea Border Commission, the Ethiopia-Eritrea Claims Commission, all cases that were administered by the PCA. This is a slide that shows that um, the PCA is also involved in uh, issues uh, related to uh, uh, Gulf the Sea. Um, um, disputes under the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, in fact, according to the Law of the Sea Convention, arbitration is the default option if um, a situation arises where um, uh, one of the two parties in conflict has not recognized the jurisdiction of either the ICJ or the ITLOS in, in Hamburg. Uh, presently, we have a number of such cases. Um, the one initiated by the Philippines against uh, China, uh, one uh, between uh, Mauritius and the UK, and one between my country and uh, Russia. And you see more details there. Uh, but there's another interesting uh, example of um, PCA administered administration in a highly uh, sensitive, politically sensitive environment, that is between India and Pakistan, where um, an issue related to the use of the in, in Ishiganga uh, waters, the Indus waters, uh, was uh, was uh, involved, and the uh, extent to which India was entitled to build a, a hydroelectric uh, um, uh, a facility, uh, taking the water from that river uh, at the expense of the use of that water by Pakistan, and eventually uh, the uh, arbitral tribunal, uh, which significantly also included a hydrographer not just lawyers, but also a hydrographer, which is another example, I think, of the flexibility which arbitration allows for. Uh, came to a conclusion which was uh, welcomed by both parties, which I think is a significant feat. So this is a slide that shows the uh, importance of uh, investment uh, treaty cases that uh, the PCA uh, deals with, has dealt with, um, obviously uh, related to the um, growth, if not explosion, of um, bilateral or multilateral and investment protection treaties since the 80s, uh, which uh, in turn are related to an uh, increased uh, economic uh, activity between uh, countries and between continents that uh, previously uh, was, was absent. 
um, an interesting example there of uh, the BCA administered arbitration is the Philip Morris uh, arbitration against Australia, uh, where uh, Philip Morris claims that uh, measures taken by Australia are uh, based on its uh, public health policy, uh, in fact, uh, um, neutralizing the packaging of uh, uh, impedes its, uh, its return on investment. And that's a case that on which the jury is still out, being heard in Singapore and, as I said, administered by the BCA. One word on, uh, not two, on uh, a policy that has been started uh, recently by the BCA uh, of uh, establishing relations with, uh, in principle, all of its member states, but it's up to member states to indicate whether they're interested of so-called host country arrangements, which allow the BCA uh, to um, uh, conduct its activities, notably uh, hearings, in, in that particular jurisdiction. Um, one of the countries with which uh, the PCA has concluded such an agreement is South Africa, and we hope that we will be able to indeed uh, start using those facilities here in either Johannesburg or in, uh, in, in, in Cape Town for um, uh, hearings in, in PCA administered cases, and we hope uh, that uh, South Africa will, in that context, also take measures to establish a clear and, 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 and transparent and stable uh, arbitration environment through modernization of its uh, arbitration law. I think it was mentioned uh, right uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the actual uh, administration law dates back to 95, I think. And it's, uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to see South Africa uh, giving itself a more modern um, arbitration law, establishing then also the confidence of parties to conduct their activities here. <coughs> this is uh, a slide that uh, shows that the PCA, in cooperation with the International Council on Commercial Arbitration, ICA, um, is involved in creating uh, a capacity in, in countries that are in need of, 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 of more capacity when dealing with issues uh, such as um, arbitration and, and investment uh, protection. Um, it's uh, entitled The Roadshows, and it's an effort to bring um, our experts in contact with um, the judiciary, uh, lawyers, um, um, people involved in, in investment decisions uh, to, uh, to, to learn from, from our experience and to contribute to the capacity of that country or those countries in, in that respect. And that's the Peace Palace again. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is His Excellency Dr. Uh, Sidi Manus Kony, who is the Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. He obtained his PhD on classification in private international law at the University of Freiburg and worked at the Swiss Institute of Comparative Law in the Swiss Department of Justice. Dr. Manus Kony lectured at the University of Freiburg and at the Hague Academy of International Law. Dr. Manus Kony. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. And, uh, and thank you very much, Professor O'Brien, for this kind of introduction. May I also take this opportunity to wholeheartedly thank the Research Centre for organizing, I guess, as a collective effort together with uh, a number of colleagues of the, uh, of the faculty to organize this, uh, this event and to have us uh, here today. Um, given the time, I have decided not to use my uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, that we have prepared, but I invite the organizers to share uh, the presentation with the attendees if you want to uh, read it or study it at your leisure at, uh, at a later time. What I would like to do instead is just give you a very short overview of what the conference on private, private international law is all about. And I would like to do so in five points. The five things I would like you to remember at the end of this, uh, of this presentation. And I do apologize to my colleagues already uh, 
uh, if I sound also like a golden record because they heard something very similar earlier uh, this morning. The first point I want to solve is a mystery. Why do you think is it called the HCCH? I mean, I'm sure you know what ICJ stands for, what the PCA stands for, what the ICC stands for, but what does HCCH actually stand for? Well, that has to do with the fact that we have two official languages, English and French. In English, it's the Hague Conference on Private and National Law. En français, in French, it's the Conference de la Haye, the one that's not TV. So if you put the four uh, key letters together, you get the HCCH. -C -C doesn't quite work in Afrikaans, but goes uh, in <laughs> So that's the first thing I want you to remember. The second thing I want you to remember is indeed that we are the oldest international organization. And yes, we do have an agreement with the uh, PCA. And you may, you, may, uh, you may think that I am recalling uh, this point just to tease my uh, very distinguished colleagues from the very respectable organizations that are uh, here with us as well. And to some extent, you may actually be right. And it's also payback time because I'm always the guy left for five minutes at the end. But that's another story. Um, the, uh, the, the other more serious point I want to make is that we have been around since 1893. So, uh, yes, we have been the first kid on the block. But despite the age of the organization, I firmly believe that there is an awful lot that remains to be done for us as an organization to increase our visibility, in particular in this part of the world, and to make the relevant authorities realize how relevant and important the work of the Hague Conference is, not just for them as governments, but in particular for their citizens, for their people, uh, and for their commercial entities uh, that do uh, business across borders. The third point I would like you to remember is our mandate. Our mandate is indeed of legislative nature. We are not a court, we are not a tribunal, we are not a registrar, you cannot come to the Hague Conference and start legal proceedings. Our mandate is legislative. What we do therefore is we develop legal provisions, legal norms, legal articles in the form of conventions and so far 38 conventions have been adopted under the auspices of the Hague Conference on Private and National Law. Soon we'll have to change that line in our presentations because we'll have the first soft law instrument, the principles that will be discussed uh, later this afternoon, the principles on chosen law international uh, contracts, the first ever soft law instrument uh, developed under the auspices of uh, the Hague Conference on Private and National Law. Um, these 38 conventions, and I have to say that not all of them are actually of equal importance. Some of them have never entered into force and probably will never enter into force. So from the 38 conventions, I would have thought that about 12 to 15 or so are of real core importance. And you can categorize these uh, conventions basically in three pillars. The first very important pillar is the conventions that relate to child protection and family law matters. I'm sure you're familiar of, uh, or have at least heard uh, of uh, the Hate Child Adoption Convention, the Adoption Convention, uh, Hate Child Protection Convention, and the new convention on uh, the recovery of maintenance obligations from abroad, um, uh, the Adoption Convention, and, and others. This is the first important. The second important block of our pillars of our conventions is what we refer to as the legal cooperation or mitigation uh, conventions. And within this block, uh, we would put uh, the AWC convention. I'm sure as a student, you will be very uh, interested to know that you can produce your public school diploma uh, in uh, other uh, countries uh, much more easily thanks to the the state convention, which in fact does deal with the production of public documents abroad. But then you also have the service convention, how to sort of process uh, in, in other jurisdictions, how to take evidence in other jurisdictions, we have convention on access to justice, we have a new convention, new convention on choice of court uh, agreements in, in, in commercial uh, contracts. That is the second uh, pillar. The third pillar is the commercial slash uh, finance law pillar 
where I would particularly identify a uh, convention on the recognition of trusts, for example, or uh, again a newer convention on uh, intermediated securities, uh, which uh, answers uh, the very specific questions, practical questions as to what law applies to proprietary aspects of cross border transactions involving intermediated uh, securities. That is, roughly speaking, the block of our world, the three blocks of our world. Now, I would like to add in uh, this regard that uh, we at the Secretariat and uh, our members to a large extent firmly believe that it is one thing to put these conventions on the table and to make them accessible to states and become a part of it. It's another thing to make sure that they actually work in practice. So we have developed over the years uh, a whole expertise in the program uh, to uh, assist states with the implementation and the practical operation of our conventions, with a view in particular to guaranteeing a uniform interpretation and application of these conventions across the world, because some of them are actually enforced uh, in more than uh, 100 uh, states around the world, and there is no greater danger to international conventions that try to harmonize things than divergent interpretations uh, across uh, The fourth point I would like you to remember is uh, just a few figures about the overall status of our, uh, of our work. As we speak, the Hague Conference on Private International Law has 77 members, that's 76 member states, plus the European Union, which in addition to its own member states, is also a member of the Hague Conference on Private International Law in its, in its own right. Um, if I had used my PowerPoint, you would now see a map of the world with colored states reflecting these 76 uh, member states from around the world. And I would say that I feel very uh, uncomfortable and it always breaks my heart to look at the slide when you look at Africa. Because among these 76 member states, we only have six African states that are members of the organization. That is Mauritius, uh, that is Morocco, Egypt, Burkina Faso, Zambia, and indeed, of course, South Africa. Um, the picture is a slightly more encouraging one when you don't take the criteria of the membership uh, with the organization, but if you look at uh, the map reflecting all the states that are connected to our work, what I'm trying to say here is that a state does not have to be a member of the organization to be a party to one of our conventions. So essentially these days get free right. They benefit from the work of the A conference and don't contribute to the annual budget. Uh, there we have a total of 144 states that are actually connected to the work of the A conference by either being a member or if they're not a member by being a party to at least one of our conventions. And there, if you look at the African map, then you have an additional 15 states or so uh, across the African continent that are connected to the work of the A conference by being a party to at least one of our conventions. In the case of South Africa, South Africa has been a very active uh, member ever since 2002. And South Africa is party to five A conventions. There is a convention in the form of uh, testamentary dispositions. There is the Agosti Convention, there is the Taking of Evidence Convention, there is the Abduction and the Adoption Convention, and we were very pleased to hear the other day uh, from the Department of Justice authorities that uh, two other conventions in the Child Protection Field are in the pipeline and are currently being assessed with a view to possibly uh, ratifying them. <coughs> That brings us to my fifth and last point, which is maybe the most important one that I'd like to share with you, given the overall theme of our uh, day here, uh, facilitating cross-border trade and, uh, and investment. What is, generally speaking, the underlying benefit of our conventions? What is the underlying effect of our conventions, generally speaking? I think the first I want to mention here uh, to keep the peak from the final point is the human rights aspect of our conventions. 
Um, and I think the best way to illustrate this is by simply referring you, for example, to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child of 1989, which South Africa and uh, almost all other African states are part of. Now, this convention is a very important convention, the UN Convention, because it really establishes a series of very fundamental rights with respect to child protection. For example, it says that states shall take measures to combat illicit trafficking of children. States shall take measures to ensure the effective recovery of uh, maintenance abroad. Uh, states shall uh, take effective measures to combat child abduction. Uh, children have a fundamental right to keep contact with both their parents. But these are general principles which are announced in the Convention, but there's no real mechanism coming with the UN Convention to enforce them. Well, this is exactly where our hate conventions kick in, because some of our, uh, in particular, child protection related uh, conventions do precisely give effect to these very uh, general principles uh, announced in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So this is the human rights aspect of our, of our work. But the second, I think, general aspect and char characteristics of our uh, conventions is really that they do facilitate cross-border trade and foreign direct investment. Why is that? First of all, because a number of our conventions provide legal certainty and predictability. And this is what you need if and when you do engage in cross-border trade or if you engage in a cross-border contract with a business partner at the other end of the world. In such a situation, of course, you want to know which law governs my contract. Is our choice of law effective, will it be respected by uh, the courts? And by the way, which court has jurisdiction to hear any litigation out of our, uh, arising out of our, of our contract? Will, for example, the form selection clause that we have met in our, uh, in our contract be respected by the court? Or can I still just go to any other court and start with the proceedings there despite our agreement on, uh, on another court? So legal certainty and predictability is absolutely of the essence when you engage in cross-border commercial activities. One example I can mention there also is our recent choice of call convention. Because the choice of call convention is essentially based on three basic principles. The court chosen by the parties must hear the case. Any other court in any other contracting state is not entitled to hear the case. And the judgment uh, handed down by the chosen court must be recognized and enforced in other contracting states, subject to a few exceptions which are not of interest here in this, uh, in this context. So there you have it. Uh, the whole purpose of this convention is to provide parties to contracts with legal certainty and predictability so that their agreement will actually be respected and enforced by the relevant uh, courts. And by the way, this convention is also seen um, by the relevant circles as providing parties, commercial parties, in particular small and mid-sized uh, uh, commercial entities with an effective alternative to arbitration. Because arbitration is very professional, it's very diligent, but commercial <coughs> arbitration has become very expensive. And for in particular small and mid-sized companies, arbitration is just not always an option anymore. And therefore, these parties would like to be in a position where they can rely on their agreement with another counterpart as to the forum they have chosen to hear any uh, litigation. Another aspect why our conventions uh, do facilitate trade and cross-border investment is because they establish international standards and a framework for effective cooperation among states. Here, the examples I would like to take are, for example, the the Service Convention and the Taking of Evidence Convention. If you start legal proceedings in one state and you have to serve process on the defendant, say, in, in another uh, state, or you need to take evidence in another state, and the two states are not party to some sort of agreement, you will have to go through the diplomatic uh, channel and uh, or possibly the consular channel to serve process abroad or take evidence abroad. And these are channels that uh, benefit from a lot of grandeur because of all the authorities that are involved, but at the end of the day, it's a very inefficient 
long and cumbersome uh, process. Our conventions uh, facilitate this greatly by essentially allowing a point-to-point -point form of cooperation between the two states and making this uh, process of service of process or the process of taking of elements support much, much more efficient and straightforward. The final point I would like to make is that some of our conventions do expressly facilitate foreign direct investment. And here the example I would like to take is maybe a surprising one for you, but it's the Apple Steve Convention. Uh, I was mentioning uh, public school diplomas and what have you, but the Apple Steve Convention is one of the criteria that the World Bank takes into account when establishing how attractive a jurisdiction is for foreign direct investment, and in particular for, for, for to open up business in, in another jurisdiction. If the Apostille Convention is not enforced in that other state, the paperwork, uh, the red tape you have to go through is so much more important than when you can benefit from the Apostille Convention, which precisely cuts the red tape and makes things much more uh, easy, that a state that is party to the Apostille Convention gets one more point in the ranking of the World Bank as opposed to a state that is not a party to the Apostille Convention. So there you have a very effective uh, means where you can measure the impact of uh, some of our uh, conventions uh, when it comes to uh, facilitating cross-border trade or facilitating uh, foreign direct uh, investment. Given the time, I would uh, like to uh, end my uh, remarks here. Uh, let me simply thank all the organizers again for putting this uh, event uh, together. I must say it would have been nice also to just have a nice picnic outside, given the, uh, the wonderful weather, and, and have an informal uh, discussion of all of these uh, points. But I am nonetheless very much looking forward to uh, our further discussion uh, this afternoon. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Given the importance of the issues discussed, uh, uh, I did not mean to wrap our speakers, but we are a bit over time. So uh, I would like to thank uh, our uh, panel members, uh, Jeff Yusuf, Mr. Sidbez, and Dr. Dennis Cody, for their participation. And I'm sure that we may have some time later in the day for some questions regarding these issues. Thank you very much. <laughs>